All right, it is time. Um, late people are just going to be late. We've only got an hour and we got a lot of stuff to cover. So, welcome to Hacking 101! Woo! <laughs> I'm Johnny X, I'm your moderator. Um, I'd like to thank the EFF Track and Scott Jones, the EFF Track Director, for hosting us. We've been pretty much doing this since the EFF Track started. Way back in, was it 90? Before it started, two years before it started, I believe. When did the EFF track officially? I thought we started, at, I started, this panel started in 97, 98, and then the track started in 99. That's right, yeah, track in 99. I remember doing it in 98. I thought in 97 we only did one panel we were calling just hacking. Was it hacking one of back 20 years then? Yeah, well, we did it on another, we did it on another track or something like that. Okay. Well, I guess, well, do we, we, will make, we want to make the official 20th anniversary next year, or would this be it since we started before EFF track even? Um, no, I will we'll probably oh, celebrate. Well, we'll celebrate both. I mean, this is, they're each an excuse for Two 20th yeah. anniversaries since it's our first one! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, I've been on these panels ever since, going all the way back when, to I can't even remember, 97, 98. I'm going to have to check my badges and notes when I get home and figure this out. Um, Technology has changed a lot in the last 20 years. The panel format has changed a lot in the last 20 years. But um, people seem to get more and more interested. We get more and more folks attending. Uh, thank you for your interest. We'll try to make it worth your while. And hopefully you'll learn some interesting stuff and you'll come back and share it with us next year. You can also see us on our sister panel, Hacking 201, which is going to be tomorrow night starting at 10 o'clock. And we're in Marriott A601 and 602. Is that correct? For the first yep. two hours, and then we move back over at midnight to the, or midnight 30 rather, to the EFF track room where we will have pizza. Pizza for everybody. Woo! Woo! How many people have been here before? All right, so the rest of y'all are all new. That's good. We, we like pulling in new folks, and um, hopefully you'll take something useful out of this, and you'll be excited enough to participate in future Hacking 101 and 201 panels. Tell, you, tell us what you've learned and what you've accomplished from year to year. Um, uh, we're going to go ahead and have each of the panels introduce themselves briefly, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Randall down on the end there. Oh. And um, the way the panel's going to work, they will do brief introductions. I will then ask the panel as a whole a question. They will answer briefishly because we've only got an hour here. Then we'll do a few audience questions based on that, and I'll ask the panel another question. We'll have a rinse repeat until we run out of time. <laughs> All right, so hi, I'm Randall Schwartz. I have been coming here 13 out of the last 15 years. Uh, I was not here last year, but I was able to phone in from my, uh, my hospital uh, location because I was in a wheelchair. So that's a long story, don't want to go into that right now, but uh, I'm probably best known for having written the uh, Camel book, the Llama book, and the Alpaca book in the Pearl series. Uh, so that makes me a good claim to fame there. And also I host uh, Floss Weekly. How many people here listen to Floss Weekly? Good, quite a few, thank you. Awesome, awesome. That's an open source software. We've done it for 10 years now. I can't believe it's 10 years. Uh, I'll get to talk to some really, really incredible people. So that's my two biggest points to make. I'm uh, David Benz. I am a software security consultant at a company called Synopsis that recently acquired my company, Sigital. Uh, yeah. Basically, I, are you still like <laughs> uh, Basically, I, I do, I wear a lot of hats as a consultant. I, I do everything from Architecture review, code review, uh, web app pen testing, my favorite network pen testing, red teaming, a lot of stuff. It's fun. Hello, my name is Jay Freeman. Everyone online though knows me as Sorg. Uh, if you've heard of jailbreaking the iPhone, I run Cydia, the alternative to the App Store for jailbroken phones. I do a lot of work in uh, decompilation. I wrote the first decompiler for .NET. Um, a lot of work in networking. I pioneered some of the features of the MM port scanner, such as the ability to find out what version of the program was running on the other side, rather than just what ports are open. Um, I do a lot of work in uh, just generally static analysis, runtime code modification. Uh, a lot of the functionality that's in Cydia is built on runtime injection and modification of, as I said, running programs. Um, also, a lot of interest in programming languages, and so those are the kind of topics that I can help answer questions on. Hello, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online. And I guess my 
Uh, the project that I work on that, that is most closely connected to the hacking community is the Coders' Rights Project, where we help uh, security researchers understand the legal issues surrounding their, uh, their research and uh, to navigate uh, uh, the interesting issues that come up when they want to disclose that research uh, to the vendor, to the world, and sometimes those people get upset about it. Well, I'm the Messiah. No, uh, my name is Shelby <laughs> Allen. Uh, I'm a security software researcher at Georgia Tech Research Institute. I've worked in uh, high frequency trading uh, security a couple of times, and right now I focus on software assurance, which is trying to make the software suck less so it'll break less often. Right. So, first question, panelist. As there is no universally agreed upon definition for the term hacking, and at best we seem to have a set of interrelated concepts that people tend to argue over. What does the term hacking mean to you? Let's start with Randall. Well, I'm going to tell the story. I was in uh, Turkey a couple years ago on a tour, and uh, it was happy hour, and so I was in the bar, and I uh, looked at the happy hour menu, and I thought, well, okay, it's half price, which is really cool. It's half price. It's a good, good price for happy hour. But uh, the sign said, for cocktails, Okay, I only wanted a, a like a rum and soda. That's all I wanted, but it's a half price for, for cocktails. And I said, so what's a? Uh, so I ordered rum and soda, and he said, no, that's not half price. But I looked at the menu, and he says, what? So what is half price? And he shows you the page of all these, you know, cocktails, and one of them was a mojito. And I said, can I have the mojito without the sugar and the lime and the and the the leaves or whatever? Right? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I go, is, is that half price? He goes, yeah, cocktail. <laughs> so that's hacking. Hacking is understanding how to get to where you want to go by thinking outside the box. For me, hacking is breaking stuff that you may or may not have permission to break. Uh, but it's also making stuff you may or may not have permission to make. <laughs> so there's hackathons where you make stuff, and there's hackathons where you break stuff. Both work. I'm loving that definition. <laughs> so I, I, I'm, uh, I recently started running for public office uh, and now essentially a local politician. And uh, a reporter asked me the question, so I was interviewing your opponent and he claims that you are a hacker. What is your response to this? I was like, I, yes, I am a hacker. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem. Uh, and I don't think that there's necessarily a negative connotation there. Uh, a lot of times the things that we do as hackers um, are, are, are arguably very good for people. Um, sometimes there's collateral damage in those things, and there's interesting ethical trade-offs in them, but um, I, I definitely agree with these comments here. That it's, 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 you, you see people use the term hacking in order to indicate kind of throwing something together. You also see people use the word hacking in order to indicate breaking something apart. So. Okay, uh, yeah, I wanted to remind everyone that the crypto challenge is still going on. If you go to eff.dragoncon.org and click on the Crypto Challenge link uh, to enter the Crypto Challenge contest, it's a series of puzzles. There's a, an easy version and a hard version, and the uh, password to get in is HAPPY30. So I'll have it right down here in front if anyone needs to refresh their memory for some reason later on. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, yeah, I think hacking, I, I see that as, as when you take a look at the world that is presented to you and have the realization that it is not always going to be as it was presented, but you can do something different with it. So you can take something that wasn't intended to uh, do a certain thing and make it do just that. Uh, when someone gives you a, a black box that you know you put one input in and output comes out, you don't know why. You take it apart, figure it out, and make it uh, you know uh, sing a song instead of uh, uh, you know run an election. Uh, so this is a, a empowering feeling where you're not trapped by the choices that others have made and you can take those choices, reconfigure them, and hopefully try to use that to make the world a better place. Um, I'll steal just a little bit of that. I think uh, product or process, it's using something for other than its intended purpose. And I think that um, inherently that's not good or evil and really what matters is your intent. All right. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and take our first couple of uh, audience questions. Microphone right here. No, 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 you gotta come up and, and talk to the microphone. We're recording this. So we wanna get the questions as well as the answers. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, not sure if this is a hacking 101 question, so 
forgive me if it's not, um, I've been working in application security for a year and a half now. Uh, more communications and training, so my hacking knowledge is rather sparse. Um, but uh, next week I'm going to be dropped into a study group for my CISSP. Oh, wow. Any advice for a newbie who's taking on something like that? <laughs> How much experience do you have in the IT field um, in general and InfoSec in particular? None. <laughs> <laughs> How long are they giving you to study for your CISSP? As much time as I need, but years. I, yeah, I thought the new version to get rid of you know, paper mill syndrome or diploma mill syndrome a few years back was you had to have a four year degree as well. Um, and yes, but that degree doesn't have to be in anything related to IT. Start now. <laughs> what are you doing here? Start now. Um, in seriousness, the, the standard, my understanding is for the study guide is still uh, Sean Harris, I believe. S-H-O-N Harris. Check on Amazon, C-I-S-S-P, exam prep. Um, get with me after the panel and give me your email address and I'll send you a whole link of resources. And, uh, old one, the old CISSP about 10 years ago, you could just buy a study guide and memorize the answers and be done with the test. The new one is apparently a real bitch, so good luck. Uh, Thank you. Know, you. I'll talk to you after the panel. <laughs> Sounds great. My question is kind of more of a follow-up to what he was talking about. So he was specifically referencing the CISSP. As, so I'm an industry professional. What do you guys think of the OSCP? certification versus the CISSP. Which one is more valuable for the sake of conversation for people that have never heard of any of this before? What do you want to do? Depends on what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, from what I hear, CISSP is, is more geared towards people more in the management role who need a, a general understanding of security and its domains and those kind of things. The OSCP is like, how good are you at hacking, basically? Yeah. So, it depends on if you want the hands-on or if you want more of like a management, higher level view of security. Yeah, I was just saying throwing that, yeah. that cert out there for people to be aware of it. It's out there. If you want to learn it, there's, there's your ticket to learn it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, can I ask one more question? Certainly. Do you guys have any war stories? Oh, that, that's got to be one of the questions I'll be asking coming up. Okay. <laughs> well, like, for instance, I got a friend who's his first day on the job, penetration testing, he yeah. broke into the wrong bank. Cops <laughs> <laughs> break into the wrong bank. He got the wrong address, so the cop showed up, he called his boss, they talked his way out of it. Two hours later, he walked across the street, broke into the correct bank. <laughs> that, that will definitely tie into question number three, and you'll, uh, you'll recognize question number three when I ask it. Wow. Alright, that's all I got. Then. That's very good. <laughs> That's a good question. Too. The question was, did the bank that he accidentally broke into hire him afterwards? Yeah, I did. What? Come to Hacking 201 at some point because we've run all night long and hey, free pizza and maybe other stuff. I've actually got friends that have spoken on your panel in previous years. Yeah, say again? I have some friends that have spoken on your panel in previous years. I'd really like to talk to you guys afterwards. Definitely, definitely. Um, just, we would love to talk to you when we run out of time here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the next, the next group comes in afterwards, we don't want to cut into their time, so when we're done here, we're going to go out in the hallway and, and I will talk to y'all as long as you want to talk. Um, the rest of the panelists here, it's up to them depending on their schedules, but yeah, we'll, we'll be more than happy to coordinate your information. Yes, sir. So, uh, not really, but I'm going for certifications, but I'm lazy about it because I, I know what I know, but I'll get there eventually. Um, right now I do spectrum management and IP management for a telecommunication company and I'd like to break into cybersecurity because just writing scripts for my own job, I've noticed everything is horrible and tragic. I'd like to fix that, which is actually why I'm trying to cut into cybersecurity now. Um, did the jobs transition, I was curious like what, because I, I do some scripting on my own here, uh, uh, Bash, PowerShell, ugh. Um, 
things like that, but uh, what are some activities that I could do that wouldn't necessarily get me in trouble, but might give me a, um, uh, some, some hobbies that I can use that would help for cybersecurity in the future? Break into your own stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have some friends, there was a group called Exploiteers, used to be called the uh, GTV hackers, they, the, the Google TV hacker originally. And they just go to the store and buy any new random Internet of Things thing that they can find that costs like $40. And then they figure out how it stores its firmware and how they can change its functionality. And um, sometimes it's like there's like um, a signature um, scheme for the firmware updates and, and usually poorly implemented. And they just figure out how to attack all of those. And they do a talk at DEF CON every year that's like hacking 40 devices. Yeah, I have to say just, um, I'm not going to name who I work for, but um, I have uh, noticed that it is entirely possible to get free internet, and I might have done it on accident on more than one occasion, because they don't label it properly. Uh, have you participated in any CTFs? Like, uh, yeah, I actually have, um, I am able to SSH in to most of our head and servers, and um, I don't have all access, but they're really bad with their passwords. Well, even, I just mean even publicly available CTF activities, if you're just looking for boning up on these things, there's one available like at least once a month. I think there's, I mean, there's a crypto challenge here, and then there's we're gonna have a one next King week. of the Hill. Yeah, we're gonna be doing that for King of the Hill home. during Hacking 201, which is a free and open source um, um, capture the flag that's being developed by Keith Watson, who couldn't make it tonight. He used to be the assistant director here, and he works at Georgia Tech, and he's uh, doing a lot of development work on networking and hill. And I will be straight up, I have not the first clue about networking is penetration testing, but uh, I'm familiar with some of the tools, just never used them. Well, this is a good place yeah. to get your hands, uh, watch hands on and try it out. Hi, so, um, so I'm a pro so I am a programmer, but I don't know any much about uh, hacking and all that. So I just wanted to know what language would you guys recommend for um, using for hacking, like either C or Java or what? So I might completely miss the point. When you say a language used for hacking, yeah. um, so sometimes you'll be writing your exploits mm -hmm. in some kind of programming language, but a lot of times those exploits can be very high level. Um, the, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen exploits that very successfully written in Python, shell scripts. Um, I've seen exploits where it's just you tell the person, type this into their computer, and then and wait five seconds and type this in. And so you're essentially scripting it in human language. As far as programming languages to learn, I would highly recommend learning C, because C is a programming language that lots of things are implemented in, and it's very prone to bugs. And if you're skilled enough at C, you'll be able to like read through sometimes the, uh, the, the assembly of the code and figure out what's going on. Um, and then that's my next comment is, is that sadly because a lot of times you're working with non-open source tools, um, sorry, non-open source software that you're trying to break into, you will likely need to get skilled in a, at least one assembly language. Thank you. So I don't really have a cool. question, but uh, I had a comment to whoever was talking about the OCP and the CISSP. Minor humble cry, but as someone with both, uh, I would say that the CISSP HR is way more cognizant of it as a certification. Within security, CSSP is kind of a joke, unless you're like a CISO that comes from the financial side and somehow got a CISO position and you need to learn how to become a security guy. Then the CSSP is worth something. OSCP is really useful to get your foot in the door as a penetration tester, uh, but even then it's like an entry level certification. And all the exploits that you learn are like for Windows XP machines and stuff that's like 10 years old. So like. Even then, it's not that great as a penetration testing certification. It teaches you how to do a lot of that work, but uh, you still have a lot to go from there. And Offensive Security offers a lot of other certifications that are also supplementary and really useful beyond that. Uh, unfortunately, HR really doesn't know what OSCP is, and you're going to have to talk to like a manager or someone at a company who manages a penetration or red team team to figure out like if they actually care about the certification. But they're kind of both useful. I would say that getting the OSCP was like more prideful, but the CSSP got me more opportunities with HR. So, thank you. All right, hold that question. I'm going to ask them the next one. Your your question doesn't have to be related to the one I'm going to ask, but I do have a list here. I want to get through. All right, so panelists, what is your favorite hack? Either one of yours or someone else's. Randall. Well, I, I, I think I already said it. That's the problem. I, you know, hacking the menu to get something I want. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was my head. 
I, I guess my favorite hack, one of my own, uh, we were red teaming a large financial institution. Uh, so in very like Mr. Robot fashion, we had a rubber ducky and we were able to plug it into some guy's machine when he got it for lunch and didn't lock his workstation. It pulled down something called a cobalt strike beacon, which is basically an advanced interpreter. And we had that on his system and from there we were able to escalate to forest admin. Uh, they had all their like their PCI stuff on the same forest as well and we were able to, to dump credit card info. So difficult to choose just one favorite. Um, so um, I, I talk, oftentimes give talks on um, a large number of exploits and how to understand them quickly. Um, I, the, one of the simplest ones I've ever seen was if you just typed in the word reboot into the original Android G1, the phone rebooted. Somebody noticed this when they SSH'd um, using the SSH client connect bot to a remote computer and they went to reboot the remote computer and their phone rebooted. So they filed a bug against ConnectBot saying that the intended behavior was that the remote computer re rebooted, but the actual behavior was that the phone rebooted. And somebody was staring at this and they realized what must have been going on. And so there was a root console attached to the keyboard, because it was a physical keyboard on the, G on the G1, in addition to the GUI interface reading from the keyboard driver in order to get the keys. And so you could type in anything and it would be run on a root shell. And they happened to also install a Telnet daemon. Thank you so much, Google. And so you could just type enter to get a new prompt, telnet D, enter. And now you had a telnet daemon running on port 21 or whatever, or 23, that you could then just telnet into and you had access to the device. Wow. Okay. So um, I, my, I'm a lawyer, not a hacker, so, uh, but let me, I guess, then talk about one of the more interesting ones that, that I advised on, which was uh, uh, someone who wanted to give a presentation at, uh, at the DEF CON conference of a, uh, an IMSI catcher. Uh, this is also sometimes known as a Stingray. It's a, a device that, that captures all the cell phones in, in a vicinity. And of course, you know, we want to do this lawfully. And this is really uh, somewhat of a challenge. Um, and so uh, uh, this was a, the combination of, of obtaining people's uh, permission, warning them ahead of time, and limiting the power so they wouldn't go uh, outside of the room. We, uh, we put up signs on the door to let people know what was going on inside. And right before turning it on, uh, had, uh, you know, turn off your phone if you want to, don't want to play. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we got it through. Uh, we still had some, you know, there were some nascent worries that the FCC would get upset about this, but uh, they turned out to be cool. And so I was very proud to help uh, have a live demonstration of an MC catcher. Uh, I guess latest two at work. Um, one kind of a throwback. Um, there aren't very many good new analysis tools for Fortran, so I'm getting to learn Fortran, which um, there's not a lot of good resources for. As I uh, and then I guess the one before that, um, we were working with an embedded system that um, ran an ARM and had to um, uh, look through assembly code to kind of find a good injection point. Uh, for uh, our instrumentation, and it ended up being 17 pages printed out and pasted it up on our wall, and it, uh, just that feeling from going like from an ignorant caveman to a god when you finally understand what actually is going on. That was kind of my favorite recently. Okay. Question. All right. Uh, this is more about uh, prevention than actual hacking. Uh, Open source versus closed source, I know, is always a big debate. But for many of us, open source is the best way for us to learn the, to use the utilities and stuff we need for prevention. What open source utilities would probably be comparable to commercial utilities, or maybe even exceed some commercial appliances or applications, in your opinions, would be worth using for those of us learning, or even in a small business environment that doesn't have a lot of capital for uh, commercial appliances? Are you asking whether open source in general is better than uh, well, closed source? Which, which um, open source utilities would probably be comparable to like a closed part. source? Well, well, well good on of specific, because that, that, that field's completely wide open. I'm sorry. Uh, Narrow your things point. like a PF Sense or things like that. Uh, PF Sense is Virtual appliances, things like that that are, well, but it's still considered a free, a free software utility if you want to, a free platform if you want to use it. 
as opposed to commercial? Well, again, kind of name a commercial piece of software, and I can tell you. Uh, what uh, Cisco ASAs, for instance. Yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> 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 it's a Cisco. Okay. Oh, PF Sense then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One answer could be Spork. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really. One of the things I've, I've been doing Floss Weekly for 10 years now, one of the things that's occurred to me over the years is just that the quality and the depth and the breadth of open source software is, you know, two or three orders of magnitude more than it was 10 years ago. And so there's really pretty much everything you could ever want is probably an open source equivalent. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, we can go into that in more detail and name favorite examples at length at 201. We just don't have the time to do it right yeah. now. Yes, sir. I just wanted to kind of build off the gentleman that was talking about the CISSP a minute ago. Cert <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> wars. Uh, it is kind of a cert war thing. My experience is more in big companies, and like big companies where, you know, we have all signed NDAs, I can't really disclose all that, but in my experience, the big companies like things like the, CI the CEH, the CISSP, things that look good on a resume that they can kind of sell to their customers. But when you go to like smaller pen test firms, they respect the OSCP a little bit more. That's just kind of building up with that conversation. That was my two cents. Just a general comment about certifications and my personal experience, which could be I currently have zero, thing. honestly. Really, certifications <laughs> may get you an interview, but experience and personal yeah. projects get you the job. So if you really want to spend your time on something, build some experience. In some jobs, though, they will actually give you a raise if you get some of these certs. So it's also kind of an incentive. But, all right. Sort of depends on, you know, the company. That, yeah, it definitely know. depends on the company. Like the smaller companies, yeah, smaller companies want experience. And for a lot of them, the OSCP is actually legit. And they're actually working on, from what I hear on the internet, they're rebuilding everything. So it's not Windows XP anymore. It's more up to date, and it's going to be a lot more relevant starting this year. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. So I teach a sixth grade computer science unit, and every year I've got a couple Thank you, kids. and God help you. <laughs> it's one of the hazards of being the IT guy in a really small school. But every year I get a couple kids who are way more ambitious than I've got time to help them with. Can you recommend like either an easy CTF or some other entry point that you know might be appropriate for like sixth to eighth grade, someone who's still kind of working under Google bashing skills? I less have you heard of hackthissite.org? I just yeah it's it's I mean what I like about it is that it's self driven and that for someone who is personally motivated, which I mean as a teacher, you need to offload some of this, and if these people are individually motivated, pointing them in a direction of a tool like that might be helpful. Thank you. And check out the Network King of the Hill stuff, too. There have been, there's a new package that's uh, got a new interface, it's skinnable, and you're supposed to, I guess you can make it look really kid-friendly if you wanted to. Um, I think the URL for the resources is on the EFF.DragonCon.org page. I think. If not, um, I'll have a list of stuff for you afterwards. Excellent. Thanks. Yes, sir. So I have both a story and a question. Okay. Uh, starting off, I when I first got started, I poked around quite a bit more than I probably should have, but then again, a lot of people do. And uh, I was in high school at the time, and I thought, hey, these people have control of, you know, they have student names, they have social security numbers, obviously it's going to be really secure, right? <laughs> so, uh, this was before I got into Cali, uh, so I was like, oh, I'll just see what I can do. Uh, first of all, IP cameras, default login for everything, and it was still able to be connected to with the external IP. Uh, it was a web app interface, it didn't require any kind of download or authentication, just admin password, great. Uh, they set up uh, RFID doors, which you could use a key fob or a code with. If you had a key fob, you could get in past 7 o'clock uh, p.m., although with a code you could not. Uh, they were not secured in any way. They could be copied easily. There was no encryption on them. Uh, there were a couple of the computers that they had remote control set up for the classrooms, so you could, uh, I don't know why they had SSH open, but they had that open, again, admin, admin. Nice. 
Also, everything in the school was outdated because to keep kids from messing with things, they used a program called Deep Freeze, which every time you restart the computer, it reverts back. So no updates, nothing keeping you from getting anything, you know, yeah. And I was just noticing things left and right that were just so horrible. I mean, the locks were outdated like on the doors and just the security everywhere. So basically a security nightmare slash joke. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think that the people who are in control of such important information have such a dismal state of security? I mean, all the stuff that you list is, is, is common even with large, seemingly mature organizations. They have all those things. It's, it's no surprise. Uh, most of the time it's because the people that set them up have no mindset for security. They just don't think of security as a thing. They, they have one job to do and they do that job. I would have passwords are very common all over the world. I mean, the Mirai botnet came about because there were all these devices that just had a default password and they were out available for anyone who could hack into them. This is a, this is a known problem in this, throughout the security space. I would imagine for your school you have one or maybe a very small number of extremely overworked people whose primary goal is to keep the administrator and teacher computers running and everything else gets pushed down and pushed down and pushed down. Well, actually, we don't even have an IT department because, oh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> our school doesn't have an IT department and we don't use the counties because they never come by and it's the same people who sent two plumbers to fix an electrical problem. Well. So, they gathered together with students to do all this. It's, it was great. <laughs> all this stuff going on, and I was just so disappointed. Get out without getting caught, punished, and going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> How much are you charging your change grades? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm sorry. What's your question? Ne next question. Next question. question. Oh, that's all. Yeah, thank okay. you. That's that's terrifying. That truly is. Um, so it's not much of a question as it's kind of a continue it's only the guy who mentioned not having credentials going into a computer business with you know the knowledge of many things um, I kind of uh, just okay so I used to work for a video game company as a, a game tester a game master kind of thing I would be breaking the code I would be you know trying to break into clients uh, things and tried to hack their accounts, tried to, you know, do all these things that you're not supposed to do. That was my job. Um, zero credentials. Basically, it was, uh, I went to the interview. Um, I had a phone interview. What's your knowledge? Let me tell you. Okay, so I've done this, 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 and this. These things may not be technically legal, <laughs> but I have these knowledge. And they're like, okay, cool. Come in for your interview. All right, so do you know this, this, and this? Yes, I do. I can't say what I know because I would sign the Disclosure Act. Um, so I can't say what the name of the company is or what game I worked on. I was only there for a six month trial period. I went home one day after work. They called me on the phone and was just like, we're going to have you come and pick up your stuff in the office. Because basically they, I guess they were trying to, you know, they don't want me to go, okay, I know that I'm about to get lost that job. They don't want me to give up anything. But I can't say that I did not give friends free coins in the game, <laughs> um, which I did. Um, but yeah, uh, you don't have to have credentials for certain things. It's just, you have to have that knowledge. You, you uh, try to get in the video game system for some reason. Don't, don't, don't spend your money to go to video game school. Just play the game, learn the game, learn the codes behind the game, learn the system, how it works. Go from there. And it's the same with, you know, hacking the computer or working in software and, you know, networking. It's, you know, you don't not technically have to go to college because all that changes, like, every year. It's just, you need to keep up with the times and get that knowledge. And once you have that knowledge and you show that to somebody, that's the person you're going to get. They're going to go for that person and someone who has credentials and no experience. So I'm going to let you know. <laughs> experience works. Thank you. Okay, this one's for anyone can answer. Um, CEOs, management's always reading about every news report that ever comes in. And they always love reading some from 
love learning technology websites and stuff like that. What would probably be the biggest uh, exploit that was blown out of proportion can you guys think of? Something that management just went completely crazy over and you're like, this, this isn't anything big, it, it's minor but yet they would not let it go. And how would you probably diffuse a situation like that? This happens to be in my industry way more often than I really care to think about. And just would like some opinions on that. Just thought, Randall, do you want to take that Look at me, I see that. Um, yeah, uh, running crack uh, was a big problem for me. Uh, 15 minutes of activity yielded uh, three felony convictions. So yeah, that's probably a bit out of proportion, $270,000 fines, legal fees, and stuff. So yeah, that's just, that probably, that probably close. <laughs> it seemed like a big part of your question. Sadly, something I can't really answer is, is how to defuse management from caring about it. Um, I mean, I can, because I, I don't, well, like, okay, occasionally you'll get a, like a flash exploit or an exploit that only applies to a website. And you got to explain to them, this is only be if the, we use this technology. And sometimes they just don't really want to hear that. Or sometimes, you know, they're, it's all over the news about some big exploit, and you're like, this, this doesn't apply to us, and, and you're trying to explain it in that I, sense. I would say I, the problem that I've seen out there is getting management to care about exploits is a really, really hard task. So if your problem is that your management is too concerned about security and wants too much to try and like do something about it, I mean, that, that, that seems to be erring on, on, a, on a useful side. It may take some redirecting and say, well, you know, there's actually a more serious problem, and that is X, and, you know, like judo that energy into something more useful than, than uh, what they're they're focused on, but if they're actually willing to do something about a security problem, that's surprisingly rare. There's something related between these two thoughts, which is that a lot of bugs recently in recent years um, have started coming out with marketing websites for the bug. And so the, the big marketing push behind Heartbleed, for example. So when the bug was found in the Bash shell, Shellshock, there was a name mm -hmm. for it, a fun name, a marketing website for Shellshock. I worked very closely with the author of Bash, um, uh, and he was interviewed by major newspapers asking him questions about this bug. Like, what was what went through your mind when you heard about this bug? And his answer is like, aha, the, my plan worked. Because you see, this code was written back in 1983, before the internet was a thing, and it really only is now applied if you had a CGI script that was calling out to a shell script from your Perl script, like you had like multiple levels of interaction, and you had like an and, and, and. And so I ended up winning the uh, Pony Award uh, a couple years ago for most overhyped bug. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like there's something, there's something there where it's like, like some bugs don't get any hype, and they're actually really, really important bugs. And there's some bugs that get lots of hype, and they're just not very important bugs. Thank you. All right, next question, and I'm going to ask the panelists another question. Fantastic. Hello, friends. I'm with Thanks, man. So, honestly, this is much more security minded than anything else. Um, and if I need to talk to you guys outside instead of this, like, that's fine. I am an IT guy. Like, that's kind of what the quote is on my business card. It's pretty rough, like, for my company. I work in a, in a, um, a what I would say is a medium sized company that's broken up into a lot of different divisions. And I have so much power and so little knowledge that it's terrifying. <laughs> like it's, yeah, like uh, we just acquired, uh, um, so I work for an alcohol distributor and for certain reasons we have to keep certain things separate. And, certain and an alcohol distributor, you say. <laughs> yeah, I started this conversation with friends. Please talk to us afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. So, Do you know where you are? <laughs> Do you know where you are? All right, anyway. Um, and so anyway. Um, Essentially, okay, because I, have, I, I, I am one of like six admins and I was like the IT help desk guy and now I'm like junior systems admin and we just like, uh, we, we just acquired a company but needs to kind of stay away and they're like, hey, why don't you go ahead and just be, build the DC controller for them and like, you know, start building. And I'm, I'm taking over some stuff and I'm doing some things and man, I feel like I can do the job. I've, I've got enough knowledge to be able to duct tape the pipes together to get a basic plumbing system, but if anybody with uh, some evil in their hearts just wants to come and just give me a bad day, I feel like that could happen. Do you guys have any like general recommendations for, uh, um, uh, well, it's Hacking 101. Like, do you guys have any, any, like, any, any resources that you guys have just to, like, just to start up? Like, if you're gonna, if you're gonna build, build things, do it maybe do it this away, like maybe make, make yourself aware of these big, these big blind spots that are typical. 
You're asking for resources, correct? I sure am. That's question number four. It's fantastic! Great! <laughs> right. ready to ask question number three. All right. All right. All right, so panelists, question number three here. What is your biggest hacking fail? And what did you learn from it? I already answered that. <laughs> yes, you did. My biggest hack you fail? It's a stuff one. So my favorite hack actually, the, the Mr. Robot Dover Ducking thing. We tried that at our most recent client, and within five minutes they have some FireEye up-to-date endpoint protection that flagged the PowerShell script instantly. And within five minutes this guy was offline and they confiscated his laptop and it was like he was sitting there all day on his phone, we felt so bad. <laughs> oh, I didn't have a chance to the last half of the question, which is what did I learn from it? Yes. What did I learn from this? Yes. Uh, laws are <laughs> overbroad and vague, and you may be breaking the law every day and not aware of it. And the overbroad and vague computer laws, you know, cocky in their neck because they wanted to come after me. And that's dangerous, and, and also that we have a legal system and not a justice system. So I've, I've certainly had fails in the sense of code that's kind of run amok, and I've had fails in the sense of uh, wasting way too much time on something to try to get it to work and never really succeeding. But maybe the best answer to this question is Cydia Extender. So this is a tool that I, I developed in order to allow you to download an, an IPA file, which is a, a, a packet, it's, it's a, an iPhone application. Um, outside of the App Store. It, it's just it's the, the format that you would download um, uh, any random game for the, uh, for the App Store. You would still download it to your computer and then install it via iTunes. But I wrote this tool which people were using on their computers to just kind of like force that IPA file on the phone by using Apple free developer accounts. And I wanted to take all that infrastructure and put it on the phone. So I wrote an app, kind of like the App Store, that sits on your phone, that allows you to take any IPA file that you can browse to in Safari. It downloads the IPA file, it installs it on your phone, and I am super excited. I am just, like I know so many people are gonna want to, be, want to use this. I'm, I'm working, I'm coordinating with some other developers and like getting little, little tips. It's such an in, indirect process to make this thing work because we have to like set up a local SSL server and then have like a VPN connection to ourselves in order to trip the system that like normally keeps you from having a, a computer, like a, to keep you from using local phones, to all sorts of little stuff in there. I get it working, I release it, and five minutes later I see a tweet from somebody saying I got this error message while trying to install it, and I'm looking at that error message and I realize that this is not going to work for anybody but me and all the other people who work on this stuff because it required you to have paid Apple for their developer account to install my app. <laughs> if you could install my app, actually, my app would be able to install other apps, but I was relying on the VPN profile in order to do this, and then I like tried to work on fixing that, and then I had another problem, and then I couldn't fix that, and then I couldn't, and I suddenly realized, no, actually, this is just not possible, and I've wasted two months of my life writing this thing, and got to the point of releasing it in public for other people to use before finding out that it was essentially worthless for the use case I cared about. <laughs> Thankfully, some people figured out another use case for it, and they were able to hack that functionality into it, which I was kind of happy about. That was helping some of the jailbreak stuff, but it was just like, I was just like, this is cool. <laughs> Um, I guess not from my security days, but in high frequency trading. So the moral of the story is data integrity is important and double check your work. So I had the opportunity to work on like a proprietary trading engine between two companies. And which means that like we were accepting orders from another company and fulfilling them like a trading engine, but we're using a loophole in SEC guidelines, which allowed us to do this and it's shady and shitty. And, but uh, anyway, in that process, we, uh, due to um, the uh, flash crash, uh, lost, thought we lost some orders that we actually filled and uh, for the period of a few hours, lost track of over $100,000. So, Thankfully, in this situation, there was someone else who was doing their job better than I had, and um, so, oh yeah, the other moral to the story is when you think you have fucked up really badly, you talk to someone as quickly as possible, because the amount of time that you spend in between, you know, could be the difference between uh, being walked out the door or not. Thank you, sir. All right, uh, before we get the next audience question, my friend Stacy here, who's coordinating our pizza run for Hacking 201, is going to walk around with our collection bucket. 
Um, this is for Hacking 201. If you're not planning on attending, you of course are under no obligation to do donate at all. If you want to come to 201 and you want to kick in for pizza, feel free. Uh, we've been doing this for 20 years to keep everything honest, and as soon as the panel is open, uh, over rather, we go out in the hallway, we pull the money out, dump it on the floor. Anybody who wants, we welcome people to watch. We count the money in front of everyone, record the number, and we get receipts for everything and show them to you at 201. That's just to keep everything honest and on the up and up. You don't have to worry about your money disappearing. So, it's all right. Open source. West, yeah, yes, it's open source. <laughs> yeah. um, my question is, can you, have, can you guys help me find a mentor for hacking, computer hacking? Are you local? I am not local yet. Where um, are you from? Florida. Off the top of my head, I'll let the rest of the panelists jump in too. Um, find the locust, uh, closest Linux user group to you. Okay. And if you can't make the meetings, at least get on the mailing list and start talking to people and asking questions. Thanks. Uh, DC. We've got, got more answers for you, I think. What else? DC and 2600. Yeah. 2600 chapters, go to 2600.com, 20, look for 2600 meetings around you too. Um, yeah, just start there, get on techie mailing list and start asking questions and going to meetings and meetups if you can find any local team. There's a meetup app that just like covers all sorts of different subjects. I think it's called Meetup. So you can start with that as well, just if, uh, as a central story. Stay in touch with us, come to Hacking 201, we'll look you up and uh, get you in touch with people and report back to us next year and let, you know, let us know what you've done. Yes? I'm going to elaborate on your question. Have you ever accidentally hacked into anything? <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, Canals, have you ever accidentally hacked into anything? Please consider the statute of limitations. Uh, I'd also like just to take a moment and talk about the uh, general good advice is don't admit felonies on a stage where they're recorded. Yep. Uh, <laughs> a second the motion. Uh, just, you know, uh, friendly piece of advice put out there. Go, go right ahead. I, I will say that uh, one day, many, many years ago, I think at least more than seven, so I think probably okay. Uh, was, uh, That's how the statute of limitations. Okay. Okay. Story. There, I'll, 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 I'll leave it generic. So there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a company that had a public website, and for uh, to send messages to the owners, they dropped you into Emacs, and I immediately got a shell <laughs> and started poking around, and it was like, oh, this is too easy. This is way too easy, right? And so uh, the next day when I went there, they had figured out a way to turn off that shell, but Emacs is universal, so it's lots of things you could do. And so I figured out another way to actually bypass their security again. And the next time I went on the website, uh, a couple days later, there was no way to send a message to the owners. <laughs> they completely disabled that feature. They do, I, was, I, was, I was Googling with them. Anyone else have anything they want to talk about? <laughs> You're familiar with the term social engineering. That's like, uh, um, instead of hacking machines, that's like hacking people and getting them to do things that they probably shouldn't. I'll give you a good social engineering hacking example that may or may not involve me. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it involved me. Um, I lived up in Nashville, and the only radio station that played decent music up there, in my opinion, was WRVU, student radio station. I wanted to be a part of it. Um, so one day i just showed up at the new dj orientations they had each um each fall and lied on my paperwork and found out how the station was organized who ran things um applied bribes in the appropriate places and it was about five years before anyone in a position of authority at vanderbilt university realized I was not a student, I was not alumni, I was not faculty, I was not staff, I was just this guy coming in and taking over the 15,000 uh, 15, watt radio station on a weekly basis and doing a show and they couldn't get rid of me then because I'd already started winning awards. <laughs> It turned out there were a dozen other people there like me. And we were the ones who kept the station on the air during the summer. We trained most of the students who kept it on the air during Christmas break, Thanksgiving break. And they had to be on the air a certain number of hours uh, a week 
um, and per day, or they would lose their experimental broadcast license. So we're the ones who kept the station going. They created a fifth category, select volunteers from the local listening community. Um, not done by me. I've seen at hacker conventions when things got kind of hot, but people wanted to still demonstrate, the presenters would find this is probably um, before your day, they would find these things called videotapes that were randomly sent to them or they just happened to find them labeled outside the convention. They were recordings of people um, usually wearing and using masks, doing things that the presenter decided they really shouldn't talk about because it might be too dangerous. The most fun I saw was at SummerCon 1995 right here in Atlanta where a guy showed how to steal um, nuclear launch codes from a French military site. <laughs> you couldn't actually launch the missiles, but the fact that it was online and unsecured and he could get the launch codes um, attracted a lot of attention. And the reason the videotape showed up instead of the guy giving this talk as a keynote a presentation is he went to the FBI before the convention and said, I'm thinking about giving this talk. What are you going to do? <laughs> and the FBI guy said, we'll arrest you. He said, the guy uh, organizing the convention said, what are you going to arrest me for? Because I'm paying for my internet access here. And at the time, there were no laws that could get him in trouble for doing what he was going to do, break into a computer system uh, from another country, as long as he was paying for his local internet access. The law hadn't quite caught up yet. And he said, well, the FBI guy thought for a minute. He said, we'll contact the French embassy, and we'll give them every bit of information we have on you, you know, name where you live, all that type of stuff, and they'll probably send someone over here to kill you. <laughs> so I decided not to give the talk at that point, and that's when I found this videotape, which, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, um, that answer your question, kind of? Maybe? Kind of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> don't get caught, don't do stupid things. Amen. First rule of the internet is don't self-incriminate. <laughs> so I have a comment, and then a question for Sarek. I think that's how you pronounce it, right? Sorry, sorry. If it's quite advanced, I'm on Hacking 201, so you can come to Hacking 201, and we've got a lot more time. You can okay, so my comment, though, is minutes. in regards to the fellow that was just asking for mentorship. Uh, you guys mentioned the 2600 groups. There's also the, De the DEF CON groups, and there's Same. also, free, uh, I believe it's called Free Sides, the hackerspace. It's not a whole lot of like security-minded folks, but it's makers. And you can go get a hold of 3D printers and build There's stuff. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of good tech. Yeah. Hacking does not have to yeah. be criminal bad stuff. And then if anybody is interested, I am doing, well, I haven't open sourced it yet, but I've been doing an experiment. I went to school for network security, and I think it was a complete waste of time and money. So I'm experimenting. I've got about 30 people that I get together once a week, and we kind of teach each other things. And I'm trying to get them jobs without degrees. So if anybody wants mentorship, or tutoring, hit me up afterwards and be part of this. Sp specifically, the guy that asked the question earlier, we're, that's kind of what we're going to do. Let's just meet up outside yeah, let's here go. at the end of the hallway. We'll let's go have there, hallway con. go from there. Hallway con. Hallway con. My question for Sarek, though, is you mentioned you, you've done a lot of, I followed your work for a long time. As, as I said, a question directed to only at me might be better at hacking 201 or outside because we've got very little time left on this panel. I'm just curious, so, jailbreaking, did you have any legal issues with that? And that is a long yeah. So should that be for 201 then? Yes. Okay. All con or 201. All right, I'll say for the 201. Hello, Susie. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, following up on the legal discussion, because it came to me while you guys were talking about it, um, I I recall that they actually couldn't do the statistics for how many federal laws were on the books because they couldn't get a, find a good way to count everything, but they're pretty sure it was over 50,000, uh, which is more of a body of law that any human being could possibly ingest in one lifetime. Uh, and I was curious, um, because there is that much, like you guys are saying, uh, you have to protect yourselves to make sure you're not accidentally breaking the law. How do you get informed to not break the law? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so I, as I, I guess the lawyer on here, I'll take the, the first crack of this, is that, first of all, as you point, there are, there are many, many laws out there. Uh, some of them are, are very esoteric. Uh, there's a fun Twitter account, a crime a day, that tweets out a new crime. Uh, you can learn all sorts of things. Uh, but for, for, uh, for computer security, uh, you know, for hacking issues, 
there actually are, you know, uh, some laws you should pay particular attention to. So there's like the, the federal uh, anti-hacking law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Or the, you look it up at 18 U.S.C. Uh, 1030. Uh, and that is, if the, if the FBI is going to come after you for, for hacking, they're probably going to pick a couple of things from, from the list that's, that's presented there. And uh, a lot of the things that are in there, you know, they're, they're boiled down to uh, without authorization, doing something without authorization. So if you're trying to do some experimentation uh, and want to learn some stuff, if you do it on things that you buy and you own, you are in the position to authorize yourself to, to do that. And you can learn a lot by, by hacking your own things. Um, but if it gets more complicated than, than, than that, uh, one of the things you can do is, is contact uh, EFF, uh, info at EFF.org. Uh, and if you have some legal questions about the, the research, we may not be able to help every, every person who writes in, but we try and at least point them in, in good directions. Thank you. Um, and as a, had one more question. Uh, there was actually a Real point. Quick. Okay, there was actually a point at my work where I had the opportunity to do some testing. But because of the system it was interacting with, I wasn't sure that if by doing the testing, I would be breaking the law, period. Um, and uh, more to the point, uh, talking about ownership of your, your data and your hardware, um, some, how, do you, how can you be certain that you actually own the data because of all the exchanges that happen? Let's save that for 201, okay. if we've only got a couple minutes left. Um, panelists? Final question, I would like you real quickly, since we're recording this and people can refer to the recordings um, for as long as the recordings continue to exist, <laughs> yeah. hopefully that will be a good long while. Um, what resources do you recommend most, especially to someone who wants to learn more and doesn't know where to begin? I think a bunch of that's already been said, so I don't know anything to add to that. Well, we've only got a couple minutes left, so just rattle stuff off. Specifically to the guy who's asking about setting up a new domain, uh, AD Security, there's a blog that'll have everything that you need to, to harden that domain. Uh, yeah. There's a, uh, two subreddits, one reverse engineering and the other RE math. There's a lot of math in reverse engineering and it's, there's a lot of fascinating papers that publish there. Uh, our central point for resources uh, would be EFF.org slash coders for the Coders Rights Project. Nothing to add. <laughs> Right. And uh, I think we'll continue to add resources to EFF.defcon.org. Uh, uh, that uh, seems to be a good place to start. DEFCON? Def Technically, if you have about 90... I'm sorry, DragonCon. Yeah. DEFCON's Dragon. 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 the other one. Gatorade. Dragon. 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 We got about 90 seconds left, so let's do one more question. Yo, there we go. What are y'all's thoughts on the latest crypto viruses that happened a few months ago? The ones that would uh, take ransomware to your computers to uh, hit, hit your what virus and the crypto virus for that. Don't run Windows. <laughs> <coughs> uh, for, for ransomware, the best thing that you and everybody you know could do to protect yourself against ransomware is back up your stuff. Yeah. Ransomware has, has you know, a minor inconvenience if all of your stuff has been backed up you know, 30 seconds before the ransomware encrypts it and a huge problem if you haven't backed it up for weeks or months or, or ever. Doesn't it have to be backed up off-site? Well, ideally you would back it up to a drive that you would then disconnect in the meantime so that if it's sophisticated enough to, to try and go after your, your uh, attached storage media, it wouldn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally, not everyone can do that. So if you got a couple of spare drives, drives are cheap these days, back up your most critical stuff. Anything else like that DVD collection you ripped and you've still got the originals, well, it would suck to have to re-rip them, but you know, the irreplaceable data, back that up uh, two or three times. Separate drives. All right, uh, thank you all very much. Again, Hacking 201 tomorrow night. <laughs>